The reading this morning is taken from Revelation 21 to Revelation 22, verse 5. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Matt. And I'll read just briefly from Isaiah chapter 60 as well, and then we'll uh, turn back to Revelation. Isaiah chapter uh, 60, uh, starting in verse 17, uh, pointing really, uh, looking at the glory of Zion. Oh, here's a, here's a, here's a thing. Yeah, I'll, I'm not going to read all that. I'll just read the Isaiah. As, this is pointed towards the heavenly city of Jerusalem. Instead of bronze, I will bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze and in iron in place of stones. I will make peace your governor and well-being your ruler. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no, no, no more be the sun will no more be your light nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. And all people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. Uh, they 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 are the shoot I have planted the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's bow down, let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for your word which you have given us. And it's to your word that we now turn. Father, it is the longing of our hearts that we would hear your voice through your word and your spirit, and that in hearing we may trust and believe and also live in the light of it, in order, O God, that you may be glorified in our lives and that our friends and our family, our neighbors, may know that you are God, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. There are two major ways to live our lives, two paths to go on, two approaches to living. 
Uh, the one, of course, is to live in the light of eternity. The other is to live as if there is no eternity. The one is to live very clearly in the light of the knowledge of God, the maker of all things. And the other is to live without the knowledge of God. The one way of living is to live as if the things that we see uh, around us, that there's more, that we're being pointed somewhere in our lives to something more than we see. The other way of living is to say to ourselves that what we see around us with our own eyes is all that there is. We've been walking through the book of Revelation uh, the last few weeks, and we're going to finish on June, June, the, June the 2nd. We'll finish this sermon series called All the Way to All Men. But one thing I want us to remember is the book of Revelation is a letter to uh, Christians, to churches, around living and how we see the world and our approach. Remember that it's the churches who have uh, lost their love of Christ, who are suffering, who have false teaching in their midst, who are struggling with what is right and what is wrong in terms of living a holy life. It's to people and churches who are spiritually dead. It's to churches who are lukewarm like Laodicea and have become complacent. And it's interesting that John, by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit, the Lord gives John this revelation, this book called Revelation, this apocalypse, this revealing. And of all the things that John could have written to a set of people who were struggling to live out a Christian life and to be churches that are pleasing to God, he doesn't give them a set of ethics. <laughs> he doesn't give them a kind of a kind of a set of laws like Leviticus. He doesn't give them um, a set of ideas or, or philosophies. What is, by the power of the Spirit, what does the John give these people who are trying to live faithfully in their day and in their age? He gives them, among other things, a vision. A vision of reality, a vision of eternity. That as we read it, with all of the strange images and the sevens and the twelves and the 144s and all of those things that have been so striking and the colors around the throne and the, the rainbows and the shining, sparkling, beautiful, precious, all the things that we've seen, the, the, the rider on the white horse with a huge tattoo on his thigh, king of kings, I mean, all these unbelievably strange images are meant to pierce in a way our hearts and point us to something more. Point us to eternity. And today we uh, come into the end of chapter 21 and the beginning of chapter 22 where we see the culmination, the grand vision that John is wanting to give us. And in a sentence, and this is a, we'll finish off this today, in a sentence today's sermon is this, the culmination of God's Redemptive plan in Jesus Christ is the heavenly city of God, the eternal home of his people. It is like an adoring bride. Did that last week. Uh, remember the people of God coming down from heaven, how loved a bride is, how ready a bride is. It is like a dazzling metropolis and a celestial garden. Today we're going to finish off this, uh, this, this, this sermon on 21 and 22. We'll go to the second point. Um, the culmination of God's redemptive plan in Jesus Christ is the heavenly city of God. It is a dazzling metropolis. Now, last week we looked at what was in this dazzling metropolis, this image of eternity, reality, heaven that John is giving uh, the churches in that time and of that age. Today we'll just pick it up at verse 22 and we'll see what's not in that city. And as I said last time, one of the things about Revelation is, you know, the, it, John is giving us such a striking kind of character of reality the way it is that in a way he uses sometimes the negative to say what is not there. And, 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 and we'll see four things that are not in this dazzling metropolis, which is the eternal home of God's people, where God's people dwell. 
We'll see four things. Number one, in verse, in verse 22, we see that there is no temple in this city, this eternal home. There's no temple, it says, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Which is like a statement that is unbelievable if we think of the whole story of salvation, the whole story of the Bible. The temple, remember, is the place where God dwells. The temple, we see in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, the high priest served a shadow of what is in heaven. The temple is where God is. The temple means the, temple means the dwelling of God's presence. And John is saying that in the new Jerusalem, in the city of God, the eternal home of God's people, God's presence will be so diffused that it will be everywhere, that all people in that city will know the presence and the closeness of God. In that verses just before it, where we saw the immensity of the city, the materials of the city, the dimensions of the city, which all pointed us the various characteristics that we needed to understand around holiness and the glory of God and the, the depth of God's love and goodness and grace and how we ought to be just, our breath ought to be taken away by the immensity of what God is planning for us in eternity who believe in Christ. We saw that that city is a perfect cube, right? It's the height, width, length, it's, which is the only other edifice in the Bible that size is the Holy of Holies in 1 Kings chapter 6, which is to say there's no temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty Lamb are its temple. It is to say that we who believe in Christ, who are brought into Christ, become in the end, in a way, living in that Holy of Holies where God's presence is is known at all times and all places. Just take away from your lives for a moment those moments when you felt far from God or had an experience of alienation or an experience of doubt or an experience of questioning. Uh, John is saying that the true end of the redemption of, of, of God and Jesus Christ is that all of those will be no more. God's presence diffused for all to know in every place. There's also no um, sun or moon. What does that mean? There's no sun or moon, it says. There's no sun or moon for the, the glory of the Lord gives light and the lamb is its lamp and the nations walk by its light. That's an image for complete dependence on God. That we as a, if, if you, wherever you are today in your spiritual kind of journey, whether you call yourself a, a Christian and, and, or, and, or whether you're somewhere thinking about it or whether you are an atheist this morning, wherever you may be, th this whole idea of God, uh, of no sun, no moon being needed is, is meant to tell us that, 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 that heaven is a place of complete dependence on the Lord. That even the nations themselves will be able to walk by the light of the glory of God. And so many times we depend completely on ourselves. We think that we have to come up with all of the solutions in our lives and all of the answers and all the meaning and all the identity and all the purpose. But no, the point here is that John wants us to see and live today uh, in this image of dependence on God completely. To look to him as the light of our lives. To look to his word as, as that which God has given to direct us each and every day. And in those moments when you find yourself growing in your spiritual life and saying, wow, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm 15 and I prayed today and I opened the Bible today and I read a verse, you know, on the way to whatever it was, school, and there was a sense there that something shifted in my heart. And that verse landed because I was having a really hard time with this situation at school because, you know, people are calling people there bad names. And I wasn't sure what to do or say about that. And I read a verse in Timothy that morning that said, you know, don't let people look down on you because you're young, but instead set an example in godliness. You know, I... I read that and I prayed about it, and that verse really helped shape my day. You understand what I'm saying? That growing of dependence on God every day, we're on, all of us are on this journey, and in heaven, John wants us to know that dependence will be 100% and full. No sun. 
Thirdly, it says, there will, no, there will not be any locks. The gates will never be shut. No locks. I grew up in a small town. The town was called Manatick near Ottawa. Beautiful town. You get a chance to go there someday. Just stop by. Take your time. Go in there. Drive around. Uh, when I grew up in that little town, I'm not kidding. Maybe when you grew up, I can, I, we never locked our doors. Okay? So at night, when I left to go somewhere, school, when I came home from school, the door was like always, it was open, right? We never locked our doors. Can, can you imagine a, a, a being, a time of living when there are no locks on any doors? It's an image of security, isn't it? And thirdly, there's no impure thing. There's no sin. Heaven, the city of Jerusalem, is a place where sin will be no more. Where it'll be impossible to sin. A city where you don't want to sin. A city where all you want to do is worship and glorify God who made us. Where he is our temple, where we know his presence, where we know the light of God, depend on him, where we are secure in him. There are no locks on the gates, where we don't want to sin anymore, where all we want to do is turn to God and praise God and lift our voices in honor to him. There could be moments in a church service when people are singing, for example, which is all throughout the book of Revelation, and we'll look at it in a few weeks. And there's a moment where it's like, wow, this is really loud singing. Not just loud singing, but I feel like people are actually turning their hearts somewhere. People are actually talking and, and, and engaging and turning their souls over to a maker. You can just picture that in heaven times, you know, a million or more, infinity, and you might be able to get a glimpse. We don't want to sin anymore. We want to worship the one who made us. And that's meant for us, and John telling the churches, it's meant for us to shape the direction and tensions of our hearts and desires today. Well, lastly, we see that this city of God, this eternal home of God's people, heaven, is not only an adorned bride, ready and loved, a dazzling metropolis, but thirdly, we see that it is a celestial garden. And I uh, didn't mean to plan it for this weekend, but long weekend in May, it seems like if you have gardens, people do gardening on this, on this weekend, so this is just perfect timing. But what's in this garden? Um, number one, do we see the screen? In this garden, where there's four things. Well, let's go through it. Number one, we see in this celestial garden, we see... The river. Verse 1, the angel showed me the river of the water of life. The river. And we see in this river, we see that its source is none other than the throne of God. Uh, this is the source, the, the, the river that comes in Ezekiel chapter 47, out of the throne of God. The river in Psalm 46, there is a river in the city of God who, may, who, makes, a river who makes glad the city of God. This is the source is God himself. And it's a river whose quality is a quality of life. It's a life-giving river. In heaven, in the celestial garden, there is a river that gives life. Now, Jesus talks about this important quality in John chapter 4 when he meets the woman at the well in Samaria who has been going through a journey of her own and a searching of her own for meaning, for truth, for uh, what it means to live under the one true God. And Jesus meets her at a well by no mistake. And there, what does he teach her? And all these encounters in the gospel of John, John, around people being met by Christ, being confronted by Christ. And he offers her living water. In heaven, it's like a garden where that river of life, that encounter with Christ, where my soul is met by him and filled by him, where we are known by Jesus, the one who died for us and loved us and bled for us, the worthy lamb who gives us life and hope for all that we need. And secondly, we see in this celestial garden, there's an orchard. And what's the orchard look like? 
Well, this orchard, it says, down the middle of the great street of the city on each side of this river stood a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit and yielding its fruit every month. So if you just imagine what that means, what that image is meant to tell us, uh, it's, it, it's, it, there's 12 months of the year, there's, there's 12 uh, crops of fruit, it's yielding its fruit every month. That means that this orchard is always fruitful. This orchard is always producing fruit. Uh, it is a truth uh, around the continual fruitfulness of eternal life in heaven. It is a, an image that's meant to tell us that um, there's continual fruit, and there's no possibility of death, is there, in this celestial garden, this constant bearing of fruit. You and I can struggle at times to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, I, know, I know I do all the time uh, with... Uh, being impatient instead of patient, being unloving instead of loving, uh, being very quick to speak and very slow to listen. Uh, and, and I'm like, Lord, I, I need some more uh, fruits of the Spirit over here. And here we have this hope for us. And again, it's meant to point us where we're to go. When I live in my life and I'm like, that is not fruit from the Holy Spirit because I'm raising my voice at someone or I'm being mean to someone and being unkind or I'm not dealing with my um, household or finances or, or what I see on computers correctly, that is meant to, we see that fruit and it's, we're meant to like be, ugh, I don't want that fruit anymore. That fruit is, that's kind of rotten. And this verse and this passage, this vision is meant to point those who are followers of Christ and who are listening and who are not followers of Christ to a, a hope of a different kind of fruitfulness, right? A life and a holiness that is beautiful. Um, I mean, do you want to have a beautiful life? Or do you want to have a life that is marked with aggression, hostility, strife, one between another, um, in workplaces, at schools, wherever it may be? Do you want to have a beautiful life? Jesus, we understand, is the one who gives that to us now. We, we, we taste heaven. We taste this city even now by the power of the Spirit and the Word. It's him who produces this fruit in us. And one day, all those called by him will be in this celestial garden, like a garden. Don't forget, it's like a garden where there's continual fruitfulness and beauty of life. And so when you see someone in the church, in your household, wherever, and you say, that was a beautiful thing they did, that's meant to point you to uh, what God has in store for us and where the Lord wishes for us to go. Well, a celestial garden, there's the river, there's the orchard. And then we see in here, very interestingly, we see uh, that there is, um, I want to say one more thing about the orchard before I forget. The other point of the orchard, sorry for stopping there. The other point of the orchard is, it says, for the healing of the nations. It's fruitfulness for our lives, but it's for the healing of the nations. And if we could just pause there for a minute and just think about Scripture, how in Scripture, the nations are so often uh, those places which do not follow God. The nations rep are represented in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 18 as having turned against the Lord, as being against God's purposes, of being against God's ways, of being, in a sense, outside of all of those things. And in Isaiah 19 and through the prophets, we are told about a time when the nations shall be converted, when the nations shall be drawn in. And, 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 and in heaven, we, we're going to see, John says, that culmination of the healing of the nations. In our world today, children are brought up to hate people across their border. In our world today, people, our children are brought up to villainize people who are not living in their country or even their region or in their place. 
or who speak a different language to them. And I was trying to find this week, um, because I want to use an example today, this video around the nations, the healing of the nations, that I saw a few about a year ago, and it was around the Russian-Ukraine war. And I was trying to find it, and it was a Ukrainian woman and a Russian woman singing the song In Christ Alone by the Gettys. And one would sing it in Ukrainian, and then one would sing the other verse in Russian, and they sang, I think, the chorus in English. And I was searching for that video. I couldn't find it, although it was really, really beautiful. I thought it was a beautiful image. And as I was searching for it, you know, you get searching, you go down the rabbit hole, you start searching for stuff on YouTube, wherever I was. And uh, this other In Christ Alone video came up on my feed, and it was by a guy called Pesky Diaprakish. And uh, Pesky Diaprakish uh, is in, I think it was, Sri Lanka. And this video comes up on my computer, and it's this guy standing in a field, Sri Lanka, and he's singing in Christ alone. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. And then five languages, guy sang in Mandarin, somebody else sang in Indonesian, and they sang in English. And as strange and kind of weird as that was, I was just really blown away again by this vision of of heaven, this culmination of the purifying and beautifying of the church of Jesus Christ, that the nations will be healed, that there'll be multiple languages singing praises to God in heaven. People of all nations will be drawn in through Christ. And finally, we see in this orchard this uh, lifting of, we see, we see the lifting of the curse which uh, in verse 3 says there'll be no more curse, uh, which is tied to the fourth thing in there, which is they will see the very face of God. There'll be a new Eden, no curse anymore, and there'll be a vision. And the vision they'll have is of the face of God. You know, in the first Eden, there was a tree of life. In, in this Eden, we have 12. In that first Eden, there was a curse. In this new Eden, the curse will be removed and, ban and, and gone. In the first Eden, people were banished because of sin. But in this new Eden, the nation shall come and shall be healed, including by the grace of God, uh, you and I. Uh, at, the, at the new Eden, uh, there's angels who are on guard. And the old Eden, angels are on guard. In the new Eden, angels are not guarding anymore. We are taken by the presence of God and God Almighty. And John ends this section saying the following words. He says, look, they will see his face. They'll see his face. This is the, what theologians call the, 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 the vision of God. All throughout the Bible, in Exodus, Moses was un unable to see the face of God. Why? Because he would die. Because there is this intimacy, this closeness of this idea of coming face to face with God, the holy God, the other God, the God of all power and might, that if you were to see God face to face, you would die. Moses goes through that in Exodus chapter 33. And we also see in the Bible that God's face means that we have life. Right? In, in Numbers chapter 6, the, the priestly blessing. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you. Why do you want God's face to shine on you if coming face to face with God means you're going to die? In Psalm 31, the same thing. Lord, show us your face that we may be saved. It's an image and it's a promise that we will see the face of God, the one who is and was and is to come, that we will come face to face in heaven with the God who made everything, the God who is perfect, will come face to face with the God who, who looked upon Noah and those first waters and saved Noah, the God who, who looked upon Deborah in her battles and raised her up, the God who looked upon Hannah in her difficulty and answered her. We will look face to face with the God who uh, looked on Mary and blessed her, 
We'll come face to face with the one who has looked at every whale in every ocean and has seen every bird in every sky. We'll come face to face with the God who, who, who has spoken and, and, and the world has come into being. The God who said, let light shine in the darkness so that we may see, give us the knowledge of God in the face of Christ. We'll come face to face with the, the God who looked away from Jesus on the cross as he bled for you, as he died for you. And we'll see through the work of Christ, uh, the God who truly knows us and truly loves us, the one who sees our whole life and will make it and transform us as God's people into something beautiful. It'll be Eden restored. That's an eternal hope. Why is it that you have that image of a garden? I'm going to close right now at the, at the, at the end of this book. I'm at the end of the vision of, of heaven. Why is it a garden? <laughs> I remember I was doing some gardening several years ago in Montreal. Our front yard was all bad grass, and so I had the idea that I'd lay down new sod on the front yard. Pretty easy project. So I got the shovel out, and I was digging everything up, and I went to wherever it was and got some sod and I, it was nice, very nice thought. And I, and, I, and I laid it out in our front yard, probably a patch the size of this stage. And interestingly, and I, I don't forget, that it was so weird. I brought my, our kid, one of our kids home that day from school. And they walked up the driveway. And they walked onto that green kind of sod. And they actually just flopped down and lay down on their backs with their arms out like this, up, looking up into the sky. And they took a really deep breath. <sighs> I don't know why they didn't lie down on the driveway with the asphalt and the gravel and lie down there and take a deep breath. They, they lay down on the green grass. And that little kid with all the burdens they were carrying and all the troubles they could have in grade two just took this deep breath on the grass. And it was like in that moment, you know, you have these moments in life when it's like, whoo, there's something more. It was like they were breathing in the fact that there was rest, that there, there was life beyond them, that there was, I'm reading into this now, a God who loved them and knew them, and there was a hope of heaven. Well, I want to end just by saying this. How is it that you are living? How are we living today? Again, this is not meant to be a vision that goes nowhere. It's meant to help us with our living, right? Right? Um, and, and a long time ago, churches were interested in the book of Revelation for eschatology and amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial. But I think maybe today the church tends not to live in the light of the end of the world. All right, we tend to live very temporal lives, just what's happening right now. And I want to ask you this morning, are you homesick for heaven? Are you homesick for the new Jerusalem? Does your heart long to be in this place that's like an adorned bride, a dazzling metropolis, a celestial garden where there is no curse only? Does your heart long for that? Or as you hear all this spoken about, do you find your heart really doesn't care all that much? Well, a passage like this is meant, I think, to prick us to the fact of our living that there is an eternity to which we're called. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about this. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and the speed of its coming. So can I leave you with this? How does a vision of heaven in the new Jerusalem make you desire to live in a different way? Does it make you, as you hear about this place of perfection when God's presence is diffused, does it make you want to live a righteous and godly life? Uh, are you tired of your sin? If you're not following Jesus today, are you tired of your sin? Are you tired of the life that temptations have promised you? How good that way of living looks 
when we first do it, you know, like biting into a rotten apple. (laughs) But it doesn't give us anything. Are you tired of the kind of food and promises that that, that, that this world can, can give us. We're, wherever you may be, it's a call, or if you, fall, if you are a Christian this morning, it's a call as well for a righteous and godly life, isn't it? We're meant to feel pricked. We see the beauty of heaven, the perfection of the New Jerusalem. We're like, my life is so far from that. <laughs> How do you behave at work when someone's different from you? Are you kind to them? How do you behave at school when someone is different from you? You know, do you bash them? Do you alienate them? Do you kind of ignore them? Do you kind of hope to go away because they're different? How are you treating your loved ones? Are you close to your parents, your grandparents? If you're a husband, are you close to your wife or are you just kind of She's there. (laughs) Wives, same way. All of this is is meant to prick us. It's meant to make us want more. Not the want that, not, not on our own strength, but it's meant to want, it's meant to make us want the Christ who begins to work that new Eden in us now. To work that new Jerusalem in your school. To work that new garden in your household, if you're single, married, whatever. That new Jerusalem is coming. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There'll be a day when death will be no more, standing face to face with him who died to save you. Holy is the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you so much for this vision of heaven. Oh, God, may our hearts increase today in their longing for the coming of Christ. And will you please work in each one of us by your word and by your spirit a new freshness, a new tenderness, a new hope, a new desire to live for him who gives us eternal life. Amen.